So what does the future hold? Well, take a look at this. Every one of these comic books is headed towards the silver screen. Now, not all of them will make it, of course, but there is an incredible interest in comics. Why? Because films inspired by comics have managed to extend the creative vision of the original works while making buckets of money. 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 Oh! Oh! Jump start my heart! It's racing! It's racing to the movies! Whoa! Look at those nuggets! And now one of my two favorite comics in the entire world, The Rocketeer, is in front of the cameras. The Rocketeer is a young hero who lives in an imaginary 1930s world of art deco skyscrapers, rocket packs, and auto gyros. Raymond Lowy meets Raymond Chandler. Great comic, must have double bag item. The Rocketeer is written and drawn by Dave Stevens. Ooh, I have an interview with Dave Stevens here on tape. One of my friends on Earth, codenamed Control, managed to sneak into the San Diego Comic Convention and talk to Dave Stevens. He taped an interview, uh, R. Robinson, Rhonda S., Shiner, Simac, Dave Stevens, and he sent it up to me electronically. I've converted my car tape player into a VCR, so now I can take a look at the interview here. Watch. I, I was a little worried about translating The Rocketeer to film uh, originally when they were talking about a bigger budget and a, a bigger studio because originally I had uh, envisioned it as a black and white film a very small modest budget and uh, done basically by us for us let's just zip ahead to the stuff on Disney here when Disney got into the picture it uh, the size of it the scope of it escalated uh, it got very big uh, very quickly and uh, the best thing about their involvement is the fact that they know how to promote films and uh, they seem to know right away what they wanted to do with it. They wanted to retain basically what was in the comic. Um, it was, we, we expanded on it and made it a bigger story, a bigger adventure, but basically it's the same story that's in the book. And the great thing about it is we didn't have to go and run around trying to find existing places on a small budget. They built Chaplin Field up in Santa Maria. They're in the process of finishing the, uh, the Bulldog Cafe right now, up north in the middle of an orange grove. And it's uh, life-size, inside and out, fully dressed. It's, it's a restaurant. I, I assume that the, it's going to end up at Disneyland someplace, or at Disney World. Comics to Movies is a worldwide phenomena. Up here in space, I've picked up movies based on Tintin and Asterix. If I point my antenna about that way, I get all kinds of Japanese movies. And now one of my favorite two Japanese manga, Akira, has been colorized, translated into English, and turned into a movie. <laughs> Comics to movies is a hot trend because it's a successful trend, but a much older trend is adapting science fiction novels to movies. But then, how many of those science fiction movies were as good as the novels they were based on? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Nancy. Oh, Nancy is the computer that runs this satellite here. Nano Cyber 3000, Nancy for short. I hot-wired her into my equipment here. I had to borrow a few parts off the Hubble telescope. I hope it didn't screw up their focus. But hey, I replaced everything I took with stuff off the Magellan space probe. Anyway, Nancy's favorite film is one of the most successful adaptations of all times, 2001, which was made in 1968. That produced 2010 in 1983. 1984 was made in 1956 and in 1984, and Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea was filmed three times in 1905, 1916, and 1956. Or is it 54? Anyway, you add it all up, and it comes to about what Total Recall grossed in its first weekend. Now, you'll recall that Total Recall was adapted from Philip K. Dick's short story, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. Quaid. Cut. Get ready for a surprise! 
We can't let him run around. He knows too much. They've got your bug. I get a lock. There! And the bug's in your skull. Ah! The movie version resembles Dick's original short story about as much as Arnold Schwarzenegger resembles that fat lady. Anyway, the movie version is being novelized by Poole Anderson, and it's being comicized as well. Comicized? Alex, I'd like to pick the category movies for $200. All right. The Philip K. Dick short story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? What was the 1982 movie Blade Runner adapted from? That's correct, but your participles are dangling. Speculative fiction is still a prime source of material for the movies. Ray Bradbury has been adapted to movies and TV. Heinlein, Verne, Wells, Asimov, Clark, Matheson, Ellison. Most of the great writers have made some gold off the silver screen. Nancy, I heard David Cronenberg is going to direct a movie version of J.G. Ballard's story, Crash. Is that true? I thought so. There's one notable exception. Larry Niven has never made it to film. Why haven't his Ringworld stories been adapted to movies? After all, the film rights have been sold, haven't they? Larry? Yes, and in fact, a guy named Robert Mandel owns the rights, movie and subsidiary rights. He hasn't done anything with them yet. What difficulties do you think he'll encounter bringing Ringworld to the screen? His major difficulty will be money. Uh, I don't believe he knows how to do a Pearson's puppeteer, but if he can't get the money, it's all academic. Well, if a film's too expensive, what about Ringworld as a comic? I am a visual writer. Most of what I've done could be done as, as a successful comic book for some audience. Some of it requires too much of a grounding in orbital mechanics to reach the general comic book audience. But that's not my fault. Thanks, Larry. I'll call you in a couple of weeks when I'm talking about aliens, okay? One of the most original and oddest adaptations in science fiction is George R. R. Martin's Wild Cards anthologies, novels about superheroes, but they're not based on the comic book superheroes. Well, Wild Cards is one of these uh, incestuous ideas. Uh, it's, it's almost come full circle because it was actually born from a role-playing game. Um, a number of years ago, in the early 80s, uh, myself and a group of my friends in Albuquerque, Santa Fe area, were playing a fair amount of role-playing games in our spare time, uh, including a superhero role-playing game. And a lot of the people in this particular group were writers, very talented writers like Melinda Snodgrass, Victor Milan, John J. Miller, Walter John Williams. And they created some wonderful characters. And after playing with these characters for like a year or so, we got to the point where we said, there must be more we can do with these, these delightful characters than, than just play games with them. So we didn't want to just do comic books the way comic books have always traditionally been done. Number one, we wanted to do them in prose, which is the, the format of the wild card book. And prose gives you certain freedoms, I think, to do things with your characters that you can't do in comic books. Certain things are more visual. Certain other things work better in, if done in the, pr in the prose medium, dramatized that way. And secondly, we wanted to do things, I think, you know, from a more science fictional mindset, a little more realistically, a little grittier. And I think Wild Cards is, is harder edged than most of your comic books. And then Bantam bought the concept, and one thing led to another. Uh, of course, the interesting thing is that now Wild Cards is a role playing game. I mean, we started from a role playing game, we became a book, and now, years later, uh, a role playing company, a gaming company, purchased the rights to do Wild Cards as a role playing game. And it came out uh, about six months ago or so. And we have a wild card comic book coming out. So everything has, uh, everything has come full circle. Our sources of inspiration are now being inspired by us. And uh, the, the characters have grown way beyond their original uh, conception. George is trying to find a new side to superheroes, and to me that's a key ingredient to any successful adaptation. Taking a familiar story, finding a new facet, and then exploring it. Robocop started out gritty and realistic and turned into a kid's toy. Stop or I'll shoot your liver out. Oh, question, question. Uh, Robocop was an R-rated movie, right? Kids wouldn't have seen this, right? So why is there a demand for the toys? Hmm, you don't think that kids are seeing R-rated movies on pay TV and their older friends' video rentals, do you? Nah, you don't think the toy companies and the movie makers know this, do you? No, 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 don't be cynical, Commander Rick. Anyway, some adaptations actually have social redeeming value. <laughs> I know, but it's true. Remember Classics Illustrated Comics? Kids won't read great literature, so put it in the form of something they do read. Cereal boxes or comic books. 
Classics Illustrated chose comic books. And now, the new Classics Illustrated from First Comics features a who's who of literary greats translated by a who's who of comic creators. Of literary greats translated by a who's who of comic creators.